first of all, apologies. I mentioned this earlier. I'm sure a, a child's going to run in at some point. Um, so I'll, we'll, I'll try and go with the flow as and when that happens. Um, but anyway, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Mark Mountain. And yeah, that is my real name. Um, today, I'll be going through three of the commonly used rendering options with Revit. So a little about my background. I've relatively recently been promoted to the company BIM manager in my current practice. And in previous practices, I was the primary draftsman or I was contracted to work at various other firms. And as a result, I've learned most types of CAD software depending on which firm I was sent to or what tasks were asked of me. Uh, naturally, I've just moved towards Revit and the BIM process as it's just saved me more time and productivity and reduces the risk of human error. So when it's utilized properly, so I've just kind of fallen into that category. Um, 3D modeling on the other hand and rendering that began as a hobby of mine more than anything else. Um, when I get the time, I just enjoy working on my own CGI ideas and images for artistic pieces of work. And this has just developed into a, a skill I can use professionally. So being a geek, learning software can pay off. Um, uh, I have some history working in practices which work predominantly in conservation areas or on listed buildings. So as a result of, uh, so as, as a result of that, a good rendered image um, is able to sell a scheme often uh, and it's invaluable and it helps prevent developments from being stopped before they've even started. So working in conservation and listed building areas, it's also taught me the, the nuances of realistic modeling. You have to model the small details and imperfections on a building. Otherwise it just starts to look um, a little too perfect and fake. Um, just to note in later, oh, Bella, sorry, this was bound to happen. <laughs> Mummy, I want some chocolate. <laughs> like I said, that was bound to happen. So, <laughs> so uh, where was I? Um, so, just to note, those of you um, with phones to hand, get familiar with the QR reader on your phone if you aren't already. Uh, it can be used to demonstrate something later in this presentation. So those with iPhones, um, it will just scan a QR code by default with the camera app. You just open your camera and hold it over. Um, New Android phones, if you open the camera app in the top left, there's an icon to access the QR reader. And if that still doesn't work, you can try installing a QR reader app now. And by the time I get to that slide, it'll probably be installed and ready to go. Or if you have Firefox or Chrome on your computer, I will show you an alternative way to see the same material. So kind of covered all bases for this. So let's start with the first slide. <clears throat> so traditionally, um, for those not familiar with the rendering, it's uh, the process of adding photorealism to your images, not to be confused with plaster rendering on a wall. Um, traditionally, this started with creating a 3D geometry in a modeling program, then that would be exported and then imported into a rendering program to add the realism. So substituting the materials from the 3D model with more realistic ones in the rendering program. Uh, or adding additional geometry in the rendering program. It might have better 3D models for trees and stuff that you populate your site with. Um, or adding light sources, for example. Um, these are all things that you do in the rendering program side. So you can get programs that can model and render in one, but these tend to be advanced and usually require an expensive high spec computer to run all the features. Uh, all programs I'm discussing today have a live link feature. So uh, either as part of the program or in a plugin. So you skip the traditional export import process, which is a pain because every time you update your geometry, you, you just have to export and then re-import it back in. Live linking, the change goes through in real time. You change your edited model, you click synchronize, or if it's just live linking, it'll just update it in real time in your rendering software. Um, the specification uh, of my personal machine is shown on this slide on the bottom left. Uh, the process on graphics cards are pretty basic, if I'm honest. The only thing I have above average on my machine is its RAM capacity, which helps with one of the rendering programs I'll be discussing today. Uh, obviously, 
a better graphics card will generally vastly improve the speed of your rendering, particularly for the animations. Um, one more note. Uh, these programs I'm discussing today, they are compatible with other software, but as this is the Manchester Revit user group, my focus is demonstrating Revit integration because um, I could go down a rabbit hole if I'm discussing all the programs that these integrate with. Um, so on the top left, you can see the standard Revit house that you get with your Revit model. All your Revit users should be familiar with that. I'll be using that as the example in my renders today. And, and all the rendered images in this will be HD quality. So when you're looking at the times that I show for rendering, that's HD, so that's 1920 by 1080 for the images. So normally an okay image quality to get by with. So this is the first one I will be discussing, which is twin motion. Uh, for external environments, this is the best of the three in my opinion. It's uh, based on the Unreal Engine. This is used for top end video games. So in terms of graphics, it's one of the best options available. That being said, it's also good for internal environments. You just need to consider lighting internally um, to use this to its full potential. As you can see on the left image, that is a direct live link of the Revit model before any work has been done. Um, so bringing in the model directly doesn't come out perfectly as seen in the image. The glazing isn't reflecting the color of the sky. There's a, it's, yeah, it's an odd blue compared to the sky. So little things like that, you know, you've got to fix in the rendering program. Um, there's a, a slang term in rendering called tiling. And that is, uh, how to describe that? That is when a texture image for a material is too small. So when the pattern repeats on a surface, you can see the repetition of the, the pattern that makes up that material. Um, in particular, in the bottom image, you can see this on the roof of the Revit house. And it just makes an image look unnatural. You typically wouldn't get perfect repetition of a material on a surface. So it just stands out. It makes your render look a bit poor. Um, so this is one of the things that has to be addressed in twin motion and other rendering programs when applying realistic materials. Materials have to be scaled correctly or large enough so you don't see that repetition. Uh, the image to the right is the final render from twin motion. So that was approximately one hour adding the, uh, I, I say ploppable 3D library content that you just pop in um, or entourage if you want to call it by a proper name. Um, approximately 30 seconds render time on my machine. So that is ridiculously quick. And as you can see, you get quite good results from that for just over an hour's work, um, especially when you've already got a model to go. So you're bound to already have a Revit model on the go to make your other drawings, or you might have something early concept stage in SketchUp or Revit again. If you already got that model there, you can very quickly make renders from it straight away. Uh, one thing I particularly like in this is the water. So if you take a look at the water in the foreground, this is one of the basic effects in Twin Motion, but the realism is pretty impressive. Uh, one, just one item in a, a visual of high realism, it can make your view come alive a little bit more and you're less likely to notice any little imperfections about the place. If there's one really realistic thing, your eyes drawn to that and then you, you're in there, you think, oh, that's quite good straight away. Uh, next slide. So we've got a little animation here from the twin motion model. Um, that, took, uh, that took approximately 40 minutes to render in twin motion. So again, a lot faster than your normal photorealism rendering packages. 3D Studio Max, you normally leave that overnight. And then you'd come in in the morning and find out it missed something and you have to do it all over again. <laughs> um, so there's uh, an example below that animation of an exported panorama. These usually work better for interior shots, but with this export, you need a third party program for, or, pa or panorama hosting website to wrap the flattened image and make it usable. Once you've got it wrapped in some third party software though, you can use it in VR goggles to view it, or you can hold up your phone and look around a room if you want, and it'll use the phone's motion sensors to look around the area. But yeah, that's not integral as part of Twin Motion. You need to use a third party program to do that. Uh, as I mentioned previously, Twin Motion's external environment tools and effects are the best of the three I'm discussing today. I'd 
recommend this in particular for external images in woodlands or large open external environments when you want to get a bit of nature in. You can very quickly build a forest into a notion and it will slightly randomize each tree placed or each person or each flower. So you don't see that repetition. Um, it'll slightly rotate them all as well. Uh, there's a good time saving tool, uh, it's like a paint tool. Uh, you pick a 3D item, say grass for example, and you just draw along the surface and everywhere you draw, grass will be placed. It will also randomize it again as well, so that just saves massive amount of time. Uh, like all, Older rendering packages, you'd have to click and place each little bundle of grass, you have a little bunch and then you just paste it several times. Uh, Twin Motion also lets you bring in other file types. It's quite a range actually listed on that page. And most of the other programs will do the same. So, for example, if you model a high detail component in Revit for a hospital, uh, say like some sort of hospital equipment in an operating theatre, high detailed models in Revit can just kill your model and slow it down. So if you just did a simple placeholder model in Revit, hide that in the live link view, then use Twin Motion to host a more detailed version say something purchased from turbosquid.com, for example, or modeled to higher detail in another program. Then the final renders from Twinmotion will use the Revit model and more detailed components that you place in. So you don't have to push everything in your Revit model and just make it really performance hogging. Okay. The next one to discuss will be Lumion. As you can see in the image on the left, this one has brought in the solar panels to the left of the house with the live link. It hasn't brought over the trees though from the Revit model. Twin Motion did the opposite, if you noticed. Uh, so live linking isn't always perfect. It's uh, something you have to consider and be diligent over and just keep an eye out for things that aren't brought in. Lumin's libraries also aren't very user friendly in my opinion. There's no search function on any of them. So if you want to put ivy planting on a wall, you can't search the word ivy and it'll give you a list of all the ivy 3D things to drag in. You have to look through all the vegetation items. And I think in the pro version there's hundreds. So yeah, that's not very user friendly. You also need the more expensive pro version. Otherwise your libraries are even more limited and your visuals won't look as good. You're limited to a handful of people models. So if you're trying to put a crowd in your model and it's got the same five people repeating over and over again it just looks a little bit strange and like some sort of horror movie if you've got the same five people all looking at you clones for example so yeah the the user interface isn't the most intuitive in my experience as well the results as a result the image on the right is the final render from lumion that took about three hours to add the content and materials correctly so Compared to about the one hour with twin motion, that's a lot more modeling time. Uh, but the render time was approximately three minutes. So once modeling's completed, it's pretty fast. And if you're using regularly, I'm sure you can overcome the differences compared to other software with this. You get familiar with it. Uh, but be aware there's a bit of a learning curve. The interface isn't comparable to other programs. So you can't use knowledge from elsewhere to assist when you're first using this. Uh, all those above criticism being said, though, Lumion has considerably more filtering options on your views, which save on having to do Photoshop post-production work. So, for example, the image on the right, notice the lens flaring effect. There's also a wide range of preset filters to add artistic effects to give a nice sunrise situation, uh, like an orangey sky effect, and you've got your sun in the sky and your filters based on that. Or you can add um, Aurora Borealis effects if you want to go into that sort of specialist unique thing. I don't know when you'd have to, but it's a unique feature. Uh, so there's quite a large choice with these filtered items, which the other programs don't even consider and would require post-production work in Photoshop to replicate. So next slide. This is Lumion still, but we've got an example of an animation again. Um, to give you a little bit of a scary idea of the figures, Lumion is the most expensive of the Depending on the license you get, it's either 1,500 euros or 3,000 euros. Its main advantages which justify that are the, uh, are the wide range of filters, like I said, to control the final image or the animation. So it saves on having to mess around with Photoshop post-production. Um, uh, 
So most of the finer image controls can be done in Lumion animation. Um, so, so yeah, most of the finer controls can be done in Lumion, so you don't have to worry about it afterwards. Animation control in Lumion 10 onwards is also quite detailed as well. Control of the camera speed or fixing camera height through an animation or filters, weather, time of day. They can all be adjusted at numerous points during the video. So it saves you having to stitch together lots of videos at the end. So generally the main advantage of Lumion is it saves a lot of post-production work. Uh, Lumion's live link feature between Revit as well happens in real time. So any change in Revit instantly occurs in Lumion. Twin motion, you've got to click a refresh option in the live link feature to push any changes from Revit to Twin Motion. And the surrounding environment options I find are a little bit more realistic compared to Twin Motion, but there isn't much in that. Uh, the terrain editing in Lumion is very similar to Twin Motion, actually. So if you know one, you could easily handle the other. And lastly, Lumion requires a higher spec machine generally. Older versions were also very dependent on the computer's RAM. So if any actions were done, during a render in the older versions, like opening another window or not having Lumion as the active window, or a screensaver comes on, the render would just pause. And that can cause frustration when you left a render overnight and the cleaner touched the keyboard, for example, and then your render stops. So Lumion 10 seems to have fixed that, but it's still got a very high RAM requirement. So if you were interested in this one and it ticked the boxes for what you need, invest in a RAM upgrade. And lastly, the third of the three is Enscape. Now this works a little bit differently from the others. The others you add 3D uh, entourage items into the render program. The extra content you add isn't visible in Revit because it's just in the render program. In Enscape, the opposite occurs. You add library items to the Revit model. So if you look at the image on the bottom right, notice the simplified trees in the Revit model representing the trees in Enscape. Now, this has its advantages and disadvantages putting items in the Revit model. So firstly, the items in Revit are simplified, so they don't hog a lot of memory. They have a parameter for every family with an Enscape code against it. Enscape uses that code to model a realistic version of the 3D item in Enscape. So too many of these 3D families can quickly clutter up your Revit model and affect performance. So one method, you can simplify these models even further. So a crowd of people, you could just have a, a small, simple cube to represent a person in your Revit model. And as long as that cube has the Enscape parameter with the correct code against it, it will render correctly as a person in Enscape. So you can use that effectively. It does mean a little bit more modeling work, but there's some advantages with putting things in Revit. You can schedule these items once they're in there and take advantage of the Revit scheduling features. So you could, if you're putting a bunch of tree types, you could schedule your trees for a landscaping schedule, knowing where you want to put which ones. You could do an interior finishes schedule as well. Uh, as you can see, the image on the left, that's uh, the live link from Enscape, and it's the only one of the three to bring in the Revit model exactly as it is in Revit. So nothing missing on import. The render on the right took about one hour approximately, working on adding the components and changing materials. And the render time took 30 seconds at most. So it's the fastest of the three for rendering. Uh, you don't need, like I said at the start, my machine's not particularly powerful and it still did it in 30 seconds. So if you've got a very good machine, it'll be even quicker. Uh, if you notice on the left image of the model brought in from Revit, uh, before adding anything, Blazing is accurately reflecting the sky color, unlike the other two. It's not a weird off blue. It's actually a bit more grayish in tint, like the sky. Uh, the bottom image in the middle, the grass has realistic 3D grass texture applied to it automatically. You can see like 3D sort of grass, what would you call it? Grass leaves sort of standing up. The water is a material in Revit. If it's classed as a water material in Revit and given like a, a still lake setting in Revit, this information will come through into Enscape automatically, so it automatically gives it the water effect. All your materials will be controlled in Revit, so whatever material you have in Revit comes through in Enscape. Oh, I jumped a slide too many there, sorry. Right. Daughter trying to get in again, she wants to talk about Revit. Um, so one of the major advantages of mistake, uh, Enscape is all of the materials already in Revit come through into Enscape. You don't have to go around adding materials like you would in a normal rendering program. 
Enscape will use the information in Revit to automatically do it and have realism based on the material properties and name. So this saves significant time. You're not going around applying materials everywhere like you would in a normal renderer. Enscape will also identify uh, some materials based on its name. So if a material is called grass, a 3D grass texture is applied. If a material is called tall grass, a uh, tall grass texture is applied. If a material is called fur, it'll do a fur texture, for example. There's a list on the NSK websites for all the names of materials that it will do this with. Um, and so again, it automates a lot of your materials. You don't have to worry about it once you've set it all up in Revit. The other main advantages NSK has over the two previous software I mentioned was if anyone's familiar with QR readers on their phone, now's the time to get it open ready. Uh, so try scanning the QR code image on the top. And I'll give you couple minutes to uh, do that everybody. Now if it's an iPhone, like I said, you just put your camera at it and it should pick it up. If it's a new Android, you've got to open your camera up and there's a symbol on the top left. If you downloaded a QR reader at the start, like I mentioned, just open that and scan it. And if you're still having trouble, the first link on the top right will open the the what you'll see in the QR in uh, an Internet Explorer. So it's it only works with Chrome or Firefox though. So if you've got that on your machine, open that link in Chrome or Firefox and you'll get the same results. So what happens is you'll see a panorama now on your phone. So you can look around a room, you can hold it up and it'll use the phone's motion sensors to pan around the space. So that's quite handy. Uh, that's an integrated part of Enscape. Uh, now panorama from Enscape can be uploaded to a cloud on the Enscape servers and there's no extra cost to do that. You then get a QR code automatically generated, and you can copy that and paste that into drawings. Um, and it'll give you a fixed camera position for you to rotate around and look at a room or use on a VR tool like a headset. Or if you open it in browser or on a tablet, you can use your finger to move around or your mouse to move around. Um, so I, I always envisage like a plan with a QR code within every room. And if someone wanted, they could just scan that QR code and have a look around that room if they want it on their phone, which is a lot more engaging with your client. They'd enjoy that a little bit more. Uh, the panorama can also very easily be split just by clicking a button in the bottom right of it when it opens, so it's ready for VR. Um, it gives a slightly different perspective for each eye, so when wearing a VR headset, you have the feeling of more depth in your panorama. Um, I'm seeing some smiling faces on webcam, so I'm hoping people are looking at that panorama and enjoying it. Um, you can also send a link to people that allows them to move around the model. So there's a second link on the top right. If you try that in Firefox or Chrome again, that will let you, it'll load in your Explorer um, a version of the model that the client can move around. They can use the arrow keys to move around and they use the mouse, key, uh, the mouse key to look around. So they can move around their model and interact with it a little bit more. It's a lot more engaging for the client. I always think it'd be a good tool at a public consultation if you want to show a model and then people can walk around it if they want and get them a bit more engaged. Uh, and if you've opened that on your browser, if you hold shift and right mouse, I believe, and move your mouse left or right, it'll change the time of day. So you can very quickly cycle through the time of day. So I like that. It's a bit more of an interactive option. You can also export a .exe file, which is the same thing, which lets the client move around a browser, but it's a, a bound little file that you can open on your machine. You don't need to install anything. You can send that to people. It's good if you know some, if you're going somewhere for a presentation, you don't have internet access, or if you, if you know internet access might not be allowed at the place you're going for a presentation, you've got a .exe on your machine, then it'll open it and you can move around the model without having to install Lumion and run the Revit model through it. Uh, Enscape also lets you see the 3D path of your animation. So you see like a little line in your model, which is a handy tool to see if your animation path goes through something. I know plenty of sketch animations, people are accidentally just gone through a wall without realizing. With this, you can see the path, so you can move the path if you want and edit it halfway through. Um, you can also save an animation path. So you can have two versions of variations in the model and you can have two animation paths brought in. So you can have two models which are slightly different and an animation path going through the two, running the animation side by side, showing the differences. 
And the main criticism of Enscape, after all these other benefits, is it's not quite as realistic as the other two for exterior shots. Enscape render exports can, uh, well, yeah, Enscape render uh, image exports even come with material and depth maps on export to aid with Photoshop post-production work. So these three image maps can be seen in the middle uh, on the right next to the interior render. One is a shadow map, the other is a material map. Uh, and the material map, different materials identified with different colors, and the last is an item map, and different items are highlighted with different colors. Now this helps if you wanted to select regions in Photoshop using the Magic Wand tool and then replace them with a different material. So it helps with post-production work, so Enscape kind of recognizes sometimes you need to do post-production work in their images. Um, moving on, uh, the clouds that come with Enscape are often criticized as they look a little bit cartoony clouds. They're often compared to the the wallpaper in the film Toy Story, we get these little cartoon cloud shapes. Now, you can very easily replace that with your own, so it's not that big a deal, or a deal breaker. But that being said, Enscape is the best of the three, in my opinion, for interior shots. If the model is set up correctly, has the right materials, has the right lighting elements, and it's correctly placed, then most of the work is already done for you. Enscape just offers better presentation methods and better rendering than what you get in Revit by default. Um, and the, the other two programs previously mentioned, you need third party programs or a web hosting service to get the same presentation effects from the panorama views or the model that you can send and people can move around. Enscape, that's integrated within it. Uh, lastly, it is less effort adding materials in Enscape as they're already in the Revit model, as I mentioned. So that's a massive time saver. Uh, Enscape does a better job of rendering them. Um, you just have to edit those materials in Revit if you want to edit it in Enscape. So I like that in respect that's following a bit more of the BIM mantra. Your Revit model is exactly as your finished model. So what materials you have in your Revit model will be what you put in your visuals, which will be your finished materials in the building when it's complete. The other ones, you can kind of fiddle that a little bit. You can paste a different material on them in the rendering, which doesn't match what's in Revit. So it's not quite a good BIM workflow. Um, and lastly, I'll just go over price. So between approximately £380 to £560, depending on the license for Enscape. Um, and you can charge one client for a rendered image and the program will easily pay for itself. So like a normal rendered image is about 800 to a grand. So yeah, one rendered image a year and the programs pay for itself. So that's quite good. So to go full circle, um, I mentioned this on my first slide, there isn't one perfect rendering program. If there was, we'd all be using it. Each of these programs has advantages and disadvantages. So weigh those up against what outputs you want from the program and which will save you the most time in certain areas. I've also only skimmed over the commonly used aspects of these programs. So if interested, I'd recommend looking into them further on their websites um, and see if one particularly suits your needs or helps in areas where you struggle with the workflow. All of these programs are capable of achieving the same level of realism. It's just some require different workflow methods um, to get the most out of it. So the main issue with a bad visual is when someone leaves out the small details, things start to look strange. For example, if a skirting board is missing out of a model, something not always considered in a Revit model as it's not often shown in plan, but the render would look strange because to someone with an eye for detail, that just look a bit weird, but it's not there. And I'll try and speak through my last few notes because I think I'm overrunning a little bit. Um, some general notes towards the end. Uh, with the exception of Enscape, Revit materials are not that great at bouncing light. So basically don't use materials from the modeling program. Uh, so basically don't use materials from Revit. Uh, try to use materials from the modeling program with Twinmotion and Lumion. Because um, they just work a lot more effectively. Uh, just use the material libraries in both of those. And in Lumion, you can add up to 10 reflection planes per clip or photo or animation or panorama. So every time you add a reflection plane, Lumion has to mirror all the items in your model and render the entire scene once again. So this can very quickly double uh, the rendering time of your image because it's got to do the process twice. Uh, so try to limit your reflective planes on things like mirrors for example when you want a true reflection and we try to do it in where it's essential uh you kind of just uh you don't need a reflection plane on everything if you've just got slightly shiny materials 
it will reflect some aspects around it, but not everything. Uh, typically, though, it will always reflect the sky, even if you're indoors. So it looks a bit weird if you can just tap and a sort of chrome tap, for example, it's reflecting the sky when you're in the bathroom. So unless you've got a feature opening in the roof of the bathroom. So. Uh, Let's move on to my next notes. So um, moving objects, just another thing to consider, moving objects in a render increase render time. So this includes things like clouds moving if you've got an animation. It's not as big an issue with Enscape because you can't actually animate things with an Enscape, except with the exception of clouds. But with the others, there's a lot of items you can animate and this can just uh, exponentially increase your rendering time. Light sources will also make render time increase. It's making more things producing light that the render program has to calculate where that light beams will reflect and where they'll bounce back and where they get absorbed. So this can slightly be reduced with the workaround by making materials generate their own light. That makes it a little bit quicker, but we're talking minuscule amounts here. Um, and when models tend to get larger and larger, render times also increase. Uh, exponentially. So for animations or still visuals, it's always worth considering splitting your model if you know that you need to do this, if you expect it to do animations and visuals. So if you split your model uh, and you're only planning to do exterior shots, you could do a split of your model to just the shell of the building. And then if you load that into one of your rendering programs, you're just rendering the shell. Whereas if you load in the interior and you're not even looking at the interior, the rendering program is going to take ages rendering all those interior items that you're never going to see so there's no point in doing that it's in revit it's good to maybe you could split things in work sets as well if you want so in your live link view you just turn on a work set for all your exterior items and you hide all your interior items that's another way around it i've seen a, a variety of ways of people doing it people split the model to an exterior shell and an interior items or work sets so whichever works best for you and um, lastly um my favorite of the programs, which you can probably guess because it's the one I spoke about the most, was Enscape. Now, I know it's not the most realistic of the three, but the presentation material it can produce isn't an option available in the others without a third party program. Um, with Enscape, those features are integrated. With a little bit more work in post production, editing on Enscape images and animations, you can get results just as good as the others. So I think it's worthwhile in that regard. And keeping in mind, a good rendered image can easily be charged at, like I said earlier, about 800 to 1,000 pounds. Animations, even more, they can get ridiculously expensive. So one rendered image, most of these programs pay for themselves, one, in it, one a year, and you're covered. And you're bound to do that, to be honest. Um, and you've already got a model. You've probably done it for concept work, or you've already been working in Revit. Why not use it to do realistic visualizations if you can and help sell your scheme? Uh, so that's it. We've come to the end. I'd just like to thank you all for your time. And if you have any further questions you want to ask, feel free to pass them on to Emrog and they can pass them on to me or I can answer them now if we do a Q&A session or just, just find me on LinkedIn and send me a question on there. Uh, I don't imagine there's many more mountains in the world. Um, and again, thanks for your time and I hope you enjoy my presentation. Thank you very much, Mark. Uh, just briefly explain the format for asking questions. Um, yeah. If those who have used Zoom before, there's a, a raise hand function. If you want to just raise hands and we can have a look through the list and um, invite you then to unmute yourself and ask your question. Okay. Anybody okay. got a question for Mark? Pages of you, blimey. Oh, no, there's three pages of you now. Right, some, somebody raise their hand then and ask a question. Um, I can't see any hands raised. No oh, question. Okay. Is that in the chat window? Yeah, I can't see any raised hands. Can anybody else? That's because my presentation was so perfect. No one has okay. any questions. <laughs> and the raised hands will appear at the top of the participants list if, um, if somebody does. No raised hands. Um, I've, got a quick, I've got a quick question then, Mark. Um, yeah. So for anybody who doesn't know, I work with Mark, so I want to ask them a question. I haven't paid her to ask a question as well, <laughs> if anyone <laughs> Um, the Twin Motion one was darker than the other ones. Um, is that because the, there's weather options on that? Or not? It was probably because of the weather option because they did a rain effect on it because Twin Motion's atmospheric effects were a lot better than the others. Uh, so I just wanted to get that across. Uh, but 
it would take like 30 seconds to up the contrast and lighting in Photoshop and then you'd make it a lot less darker. Or you could just do that in Twinmotion before you did the render. Okay, great. Um, so there are quite a few questions in the chat, but most of those have actually already been answered by other people. So unless we've got any more questions, um, thank you very much, Mark. Cheers.